Kate Sweetman is an author, editor, a leadership consultant, and a celebrated speaker. She is the founding principal and chief talent officer at her company. Kate worked as an editor at the Harvard Business Review and currently working at MIT's Legatum Center for Development and Entrepreneurship. She was also an advisor at Yale University for Women's Leadership Initiative. Kate has been named the Emerging Guru from the Times of London and was listed as Thinkers 50 for her body of work during her career. She co-authored Leadership Code and Reinvention. She also has a BA from Yale University and an MBA from Harvard Business School. We are here today with the wonderful Kate Sweetman. Kate is here all the way from Boston, one of my favorite cities. I was there at school and I remember it very fondly. Kate is superwoman as far as I'm concerned. Um, she's a Harvard graduate. She was an editor at the Harvard Business Review. Uh, she's a mother of two lovely daughters. She's traveling the whole world. She's traveling the emerging markets and giving her sort of insights and learnings and research and thoughts and connecting all the dots together. And she's going to wonderful places like Malaysia, Pakistan, and now today in Dubai, she's talking to us about invention and reinvention. And this is actually the title of her book, Reinvention. And, uh, and it's to be delighted and privileged to have you, Kate. Welcome. It is I who am del <laughs> delighted and privileged. I love being here. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so wonderful. You know, you're one of those people that the, the very first time I met you, you know, when you connect uh, and you feel a sense of chemistry and connection, Honestly, and, and I actually felt that the very, very first time I met you. So, <laughs> absolutely. And, and then uh, we've evolved and developed from there. So, wonderful to see you again. Take us back to your life. What is your story? Where do you come from? Third child in the family. Yeah. I had an older brother, older sister. Definitely benefited from being the youngest in the family mm -hmm. because I sort of understood how the system worked. So, yeah. I um, sort of set my sights on uh, academics, yeah. which uh, is very highly valued in my family. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I did go to Yale, which was a fantastic experience. Yeah. It's close to my heart. I have my reunion coming up. I won't tell you which number, <laughs> but that's coming up in just a month, like a month from today, I right. think I'll be at my reunion. And uh, I majored in English. I was really lucky to come from a family um, who said, I mean, nowadays, I guess you'd say follow your bliss mm -hmm. or whatever, but uh, the idea was to just study what you loved and, and, tr and try to be good at that. And I think that that was such a fantastic message to get. So while even in whatever year it was, I was in college, um, majoring in English wasn't probably the most practical thing you could do. It has certainly served me very well. And well, I'm a huge believer in the liberal arts, okay. which I know is where you're going. Absolutely. After what I heard you say yesterday. It is an important degree to have because I think uh, English sort of sets you up for learning, for literature, for journalism, for narrative, for branding. Yeah. Uh, there's so for many psychology. advantages for psychology. For thinking mm -hmm. for yourself. Mm -hmm. Because the great thing, the thing that I loved about the English major, besides the fact that I got to read novels, you know, yes. Yes. Um, was that it's just you and the text. Mm -hmm. It's just you and the text and what do you think about it? And what do you get out of it? And what themes do you see? Mm -hmm. and what do the details tell you? And I think that for me, those are very transferable skills into exactly the work that I do now. Because when I work with an organization, the first thing you do is go in and say, well, what's really happening here? Mm -hmm. And what needs to happen here? And then how can we help close the gap? So um, I, 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 I wasn't kidding when I said certain sorts of people thought that an English major was a waste of time. Yes. But it's so not a waste of time. It was yeah, a fantastic yeah. preparation for the life that I live right now. Last year was the year of reading in this country. And uh, so every child was given a book to read and uh, reading was being celebrated, which is interesting. Do you think reading is fading away in terms of its purity and, and its ability to imagine stuff and, and get yourself you know, completely immersed in, 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 the, in a story? Uh, yeah, we're all afraid of that, aren't we? And by the way, I was reading the paper, the local paper this morning, and I saw that they had the, that reading contest going on. I think that's right. fantastic. <laughs> Uh, because I do think it is, it, it does require more of you, more of your own imagination. I, I, I can't not read. Mm 
mm-hmm. a novel myself. I'm actually reading one right now that I really can't put down. Um, it takes place in you know 1850 in China, and yep. it's a story of two girls. Anyway, but um, I actually think you're right because just today I was ordering a book on Amazon, mm-hmm. and I noticed that the order in which they direct you toward which department do you want to order from is video, movie and TV, mm-hmm. and then books. Yeah. And I think if books were more ordered, they would be the first category. Indeed, and I think part of uh, the work that I do, and I'm looking at, at technology versus humanity and, and automation versus uh, how we uh, evolve as human beings. One of the things uh, I was reading was that there are, there's a thesis that you don't really, kids really don't need to read anymore, in the sense that everything can, you can speak into it. So therefore, why do you want to read something? Mm-hmm. Because uh, voice recognition is sufficiently strong now. What kind of advice would you give to young people today, or young, or parents with young children today, in terms of getting kids to read? Well, I think reading is incredibly important, and I think writing is incredibly important. And I speak as a former editor. Because when I was an editor at HBR, sometimes what we would do is we would adapt a book to an article or a speech to an article. And, and a great speech is quite a different thing from a great article. Yeah. Um, and, and, we, and we all know this um, because you can, um, and I say this as a speaker as well, um, you can say a lot less in a speech. Mm-hmm. Um, you can sort of articulate yourself in a sense better because it's more about repetition and it's more about entertainment. And I'm not saying that as a criticism, it's just a different medium. When you write, you need to be much more succinct, you need to be much more, um, I don't mean to say thoughtful, but you need to, you just need to plan it out a lot better because people interpret it, they, they interpret it more rigorously. <laughs> So I, I personally think, and, and, and having been an editor to a lot of very well-known people who yeah. are super smart, but who actually have a harder time articulating themselves than you might realize, um, I value writing very, very much for how much it requires of us to clarify our own thinking. Let's go back to your early days. Uh, any moments of inspiration, any memories uh, from your young days? Uh, a father or a teacher or a mother who said something to you that helped you define yourself? I think there have been a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people who yeah. have had a huge impact on me. I and mean, of course, my parents mm-hmm. um, who are, you know, had very different styles mm-hmm. um, and in a way different messages, but, uh, but both helped me tremendously in their own ways. I was just talking about my mother the other day with somebody and I, I think, you know, she did a lot of things that, you know, great moms do. Mm-hmm. Um, one of which was she uh, sort of helped me pass my own anxiety around, you know, doing a good job, for yeah. example. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people fall into the trap of wanting to be perfectionist, which yeah. I actually don't, but I still want to do a good job. <laughs> and my mother said something to me that I always carried with me, and I take it to my own children, and I think it helps me a lot every single day, which is you can only do the best you can do in this moment, mm-hmm. right? That's good. That's great You advice. can only do the best, and, and I think that takes a lot of pressure off, Yeah. you know. But I think for my dad, um, he was a very creative guy, actually, but also very logical at the same time. He really had that both sides. And so um, uh, he, he was my tutor in my trigonometry class. I'll never forget this. And whenever I feel like, OK, I need to calm down, get organized, and, 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 and you know, more logical, I, I can just I, I, I re-see that kitchen table. Mm-hmm. That I sat with him at, you know, to, to do that. So I know that. But I had great, I had some really terrific teachers, my guidance counselor. Um, you know, I, I just, I came from a very supportive place. You're very lucky. You're very fortunate. I'm uh, very fortunate. So, mo- very fortunate. So, so moving forward from your, from your uh, school days, uh, getting into, into business, what was your first job? Oh, I had a terrible job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> really terrible. I made some very bad decisions. Um, and, but... To my credit, I would keep moving. Okay. So I was certainly willing to recognize the mistake. So I don't want to name names, but um, I don't know what possessed me. But, <laughs> but I took this really dumb job uh, right out of college. I think I felt I needed a job out of college. Yeah. I didn't want to not have one. And um, actually, I was I was coming from a place of fear. I was afraid to go into publishing because I thought, oh gosh, if if I don't like it, then well, where I go. 
So I wanted to sort of start in this other place, and that would be like my fallback. I don't know. It's crazy. I, I'm not saying it made sense, but uh, it was it was the 80s. You know, everybody was going to business school, and so anyway, I, I, I took this marketing job, and it was with a terrible company in a dying <laughs> industry. It was such a bad idea, and as soon as I got in, I wanted to get out. But I'll tell you, it was actually a good experience in the sense that. Um, you know, again, our business is reinvention, right? And so I, I took a job in at the textile industries in the 1980s, a dying industry, right? And I, I was surrounded by all these middle-aged men, you know, at the time, who were all watching their life's work um, become less and less relevant mm -hmm. um, and, and who were very, very afraid. And, and for good reason, because um, they had very antiquated systems they really couldn't compete, and Asia was taking away their business. Mm -hmm. So I've lived this reinvention thing is not new. It, it's it, and 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 I've and I've been at the epicenter of a very sad story, um, and so I, I can empathize very much, very much empathize with what people face when they see this world changing all around them, and they really don't know what to do. And in their case, they were just hoping they could retire. Like, can this thing last? <laughs> can this thing last long enough? So that I can retire from here. Yeah. So, um, so I had a terrible job, and then I, I sort of bailed out of that into a, kind of another bad job. Then I thought, I oh, know I'll go to law school. So I took a job as a paralegal, and then I was like, okay, then I'm never going to law school after that. And then I got a terrific job. So I had four jobs in four years, right. four jobs in four years. So you know, bing, bang, bong, just trying to try new things. And finally, I said, you know what? I will do this business thing. I better go to graduate school. Mm -hmm. So that's when I applied. I applied to three schools and ended up going to Harvard. And that ended up being a really good choice. So for anyone out there <laughs> who doesn't know what they want to do, very few people do, um, and you just got to keep looking. It's interesting you're saying that because I think a lot of, and, and this is much more, much more of a modern thing where people are tinkering and trying and, and the... Oh, I was the first millennial. <laughs> I actually think I was the first millennial. I was just brought, born in the wrong era, but, yeah. uh, you know, very, very much about self-actualization, very much about keeping moving, um, very much about finding your passion, your thing. Um, and I don't know why I felt the freedom to do that, except maybe I, in effect, I kind of was taught that by, you know, my parents who said, do what you love. So how did you end up with Harvard Business Review? So, uh, well, I went to Harvard Business School, mm -hmm. and I stayed for an extra year as a research associate, which was really great. I love doing research, and I love kind of getting the inside story. And the Harvard methodology, as you may know, is um, the case method. Yeah. So you're not doing, uh, you know, you're, it's not big data. It's stories. Mm -hmm. It's storytelling. So you see how the English thing starts to play in. Yeah. So I just had a very cool job where you go in and you interview people and you find out their story and put it together in a compelling way. Um, so, that, so that was a lot of fun. And then I went from there to working for a consulting firm that, um, as we said, converts strategy into action. I didn't even know it was HR, actually. <laughs> it was converting strategy into action. So, uh, so we had a... Uh, so I'm giving you some backstory here. Yeah. So I, so um, we basically worked with the Fortune 200. So Johnson and Johnson, Bristol Myers Squibb, um, you know the Titans, you know the Titans, uh, uh, British Petroleum, Chase Manhattan Bank. I mean all these guys. And so it was a tremendous training ground. Um, and it was back in the day when they used externals to do ne proper needs assessment. So we would go in and just interview 60, 70 people and get the story and figure out. It was, it was great. I mean, it was a lot of work, but it was such a tremendous learning ground. Um, and I did that for about, and then I would write cases and we would develop the programs and do the leadership. But it was really, um, I was on the road a lot. You know, I was on the road a lot. And so I, um, was just very fortunate to hear about an opening at Harvard Business Review. And I went in and interviewed for it, and uh, they make you do a lot of free editing to see if you're <laughs> any good. And fortunately, I passed. And so I was incredibly lucky. I got, this, I got the job as the editor on the leadership area. I mean, so it was incredible. You must have met all sorts of wonderful people while you're doing that. I did. I had fantastic. I worked with Ron Heifetz. I worked with Jim Collins. 
I worked with Dave Ulrich. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just worked with tremendous people and it was um, a great learning ground and it was actually a, a great confidence booster mm -hmm. because I was really able to, you know, be of service, uh, you know, in a meaningful way uh, with these people who are, you know, stars. So in this, so while we, you were looking at uh, leadership with all of these amazing leaders, and I know you mentioned Dave Ulrich, who, who I've worked with, yeah. um, they are great leaders. What kind of attributes, leadership attributes, did you find that were consistent and constantly coming out, whatever the kind of case studies you were working on? Yeah, well, I guess I would fast forward to the book that I ended up writing with Dave yeah. Ulrich. Um, but I also have to give a huge nod to Ron Heifetz because I love his work on adaptive leadership. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's very, very relevant to this reinvention work mm -hmm. because, um, because, because he really deals um, very uh, sensitively and practic pragmatically with this notion of you know how much change can people stand, mm -hmm. and that it's really the job of the leader to be sensitive to that and to and to realize that there will be stress and there will be strain, um, and you need to take people through at a pace that they can tolerate. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, um, I mean that to me is like, is very very important. And I've seen over and over and over in my consulting work, um, how important having a, an ability to calibrate that really is. It's interesting you're saying that because now with the kind of Moore's law and, and exponential growth uh, and the growth curve is so steep, mm -hmm. uh, how does that fit in with allowing people to have their pace? Because I don't think there's any uh, facility left for that. Well, that's interesting because um, I actually I just came from, I haven't even talked to you about this, but I, I was, mm. I had to leave early a pilot program that we were doing in Samui okay. um, in order to be here for okay. Naseba. And it's actually around personal reinvention. And the question is, how can you boost your resilience? How can you quickly get yourself into a place that you can shape shift mm -hmm. um, without losing, <laughs> without becoming exhausted or just losing, you know, all ability <laughs> um, to, to cope? Um, so we're, we were experimenting a lot with um, different ways of looking at how to boost, uh, you know, sort of centeredness and mindfulness. Um, we, d we worked with a free diving master on that. Okay. Um, we worked with an energy healer mm -hmm. who was, um, you know, how, how to sort of address your issues in an extremely quick way. Um, so we're, uh, so our personal reinvention workshop is really helping people to understand very quickly, you know, how to get from dissatisfaction to, to, to a proper path mm -hmm. and then what they need to create around themselves so they can succeed. Wonderful. Tell us, yeah. I hope that was helpful. That was actually, uh, and I think contextually it helps a lot in terms of how you can start bridging things because I, I'm a great believer in, in looking at alternative methods uh, as opposed to just, uh, because I, I, I grew up on, on grit and hard work. You, yeah. know, you can just push through and just, but I think now a lot of the, uh, mindfulness and, and meditation and healing and learning, all of those elements are an integral part of our growth. And I think those are the things I've started adopting. Sometimes not that successfully when I started We adopting. should really try free diving. Okay. Because I, so this, because, uh, yeah, we all try to do mindfulness and meditation. We yeah. all keep falling off that ladder, yeah, yeah. you know, um, but there was something about that environment, you know, yeah. of, you know, being in the warm water and everything that uh, made it much more possible. Indeed. So yeah. So so to your question, I agree. So so there is people can only stand so much. Mm -hmm. So the so so how do we boost their ability to stand more? Yeah. And and so that's part of what we're experimenting with in our work. And I think um, w with ourselves and with other people, how can we help people to not mind, mm -hmm. <laughs> in effect, to disconnect from worrying about I'm not doing today what I did yesterday. I'm not hanging around with the same people. I'm not doing the same thing. I'm going into a new place. I don't really know what I'm doing, but I, I can find in myself the confidence to go forward. So, so what is that element inside you which builds confidence? Because your earlier jobs were based around being scared of not having a job or not the right job, so you moved fast and tried out a lot of things. What do we need to build inside us as, as an average person out there? what's the essence of what we need to build to be resilient and keep coping with these changes in the world? Yeah, I think it's um, to build a faith in ourselves that we can grow in whatever direction we need to grow. It's about courage. 
it's about courage. We can grow in so many different ways that we just don't do because we're not challenged or we, are, we have a, you know, a mental model of ourselves. Uh, we're sticking to an old definition of who we are. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's, that's what we're trying to push on and experiment with. Tell us about the book and how it's helping you uh, articulate your message better and how's, how is it helping companies and, and individuals within companies so, you know, tell us about the book. Yeah, okay. So, um, what we find people are really resonating with in the book is uh, this, this whole idea. We, we describe sort of this, the spectrum of, we're sort of naming the problem, mm -hmm. you know, we're naming the challenge, we're naming the opportunity, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. The spectrum of um, change that's, that's somewhat foreseeable mm -hmm. that we can help prepare ourselves for, which is where you hope to be, right? Mm -hmm. And then the change that just boom, that takes you over. And we use some metaphors to get at that that people really identify with, I think. Um, and the takeaway from that is you do want to be out there sounding, you know, listening to the environment, having buoys out there, listening devices, whatever metaphor you want. Um, but really what you need are people inside who have courage, um, who are, the word we use is fearless. Mm -hmm. Who, who just believe in themselves that whatever is coming, they will be able to cope with. They will be able to do that. And they'll be able to rally people around them to figure it out. And we see this over and over again. I mean, in, in, um, in our previous work, it's just happening faster now. So let me give you a for instance, um, an example. Um, one of the most interesting and rewarding projects I ever worked on was with Verizon. Mm -hmm which is a huge American telecommunications company, yeah. which for some reason everyone on the planet has heard of, even <laughs> though they're in the United States only. I've never figured that one out. Um, and they are the merger of Bell Atlantic and uh, GTE. And when they came together in 2000, um, the challenge that Ivan Seidenberg, who's a fantastic CEO and his senior leadership team faced was um, how do we help change people inside the organization so that this huge company with 200,000 people in it will be able to move like nimbly and with grace um, in an environment where there's new technologies popping up all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. I and mean, the whole reason why we have these baby bells is because there's technology changes mm -hmm. and, and new things happening. And so what they needed to do was to create uh, a cadre, you know, a, a, a whole population of people who no longer looked up for the boss to tell them what to do, which is how they'd been raised, which in fact is why they'd gone to work for a tele for, yeah. for, for AT&T, right? But who in fact instead looked out and saw things, either a customer need or a new technology, and would bring that back inside and would alert people and would form teams. and would, It was a completely different way of, wor of, of uh, learning. How do you get people who will, you know, who will own that and bring it inside the organization. And, um, and in fact, when, when we went in to do our work with them, you know, we were used to working more with the senior leadership and the director level. And they said, well, we want to work with you, but we actually want you to work with the frontline workers and, the, and their supervisors. And I was like, oh my God. Okay, not frontline workers, but the supervisors and the people above them. And we said, you know, why would that be? And they said, because they're the most important people in this organization. <laughs> yes. Because they're the ones who are actually encountering all the stuff that we need to know about. And so what you need to do is help them to realize that they all need to be leaders. They all need to be leaders. It's not about us telling them what to do. It's about them being the sensing organisms out there who will bring things in and then figure out how to make it happen. So, um, so that's very exciting. So, and they needed to be somewhat fearless. They needed to make mistakes. They needed to take on entirely new um, behaviors. They needed to conceive of themselves differently. Mm -hmm. They needed to let certain things go and take on other new things. They, they basically had to go through what it is we're talking about mm -hmm. you know, in this book. And they had to understand themselves better. And they had to understand other people better. Yeah. I heard you talk yesterday and you said, listen, it's the, the future is all about building trust and yeah. the future is all about building community. And the future is all about building interconnectedness. And you're absolutely right. And that's what these people knew 15 years ago. <laughs> yes. And that's why they are so successful. Yeah.
The last time I saw you present, uh, you spoke about blindfolds, and I found it fascinating because I can totally empathize and relate to several of them, and I'm embarrassed to I can admit. I relate to all of them. <laughs> exactly. I'm embarrassed to admit that I do. Um, but I'm also aware enough and conscious enough to be able to take them off regularly and you know, peek, peek out. Uh -huh. um, what are those six blindfolds that you find that companies and people in those companies encounter all of the, okay, all the time? Okay, so mm -hmm. our topic is reinvention, right? right. So, so, so in order to reinvent, you have to be able to see clearly. Yep. You have to be able to see reality clearly. And what we find is that we don't, mm -hmm. right? And so this is why we're surprised. So what we call the six deadly blindfolds <laughs> are our way of just naming these things that, that these, these, these things that people allow to get in their way. So these are self-imposed blindfolds like arrogance, mm -hmm. like not listening to negative feedback, mm -hmm. like not paying attention to what your competition is doing, which might be better than what you're doing, mm -hmm. like not really understanding, empathizing with, stepping into the shoes of the customer, mm -hmm. but trying to just impose something on them, like, um, like, like, Avoiding the unavoidable, you know, riding a disaster down and down in. So those are the kinds of things that yep. we call blindfolds. And uh, I've worn them all. Um, <laughs> uh, many companies wear them, and, yeah. and they are uh, they're eminently destructible, uh, it, uh, destructive, and they can also be taken off. I understand exactly what you're saying. However, it, it, it affects companies much more than individuals. Or does it affect individuals too? So young what, people. Wearing a blindfold. Uh, yeah. Oh. Gosh, they completely affect individuals. Okay. Um, so, I, I mean, I understand some of your, your, your listenership might yeah. be people looking for jobs, right? Yes. So, if you have blindfolds on yeah. because you're anxious or mm -hmm. fearful, mm -hmm. and so you're, um, you're, not really, you're not really taking in mm -hmm. the right information, um, you, may be, you may be dismissing important information. Right. So, one, you may go in for a job interview, and you may... Be arrogant. Mm -hmm. You may think they're lucky to have me, <laughs> and they're going to pick up on that, yeah. and they will not want you, right? You, um, you may, you may find that you're not getting jobs, even though you go on interviews. Well, there is some feedback coming at you yeah. in that process that that you're that you that you really should uh, seek information on. If you were to hire somebody, uh, what sort of Two or three attributes would you be looking for? Would you looking, be looking for degrees and, and masses of qualifications, or what else would you be looking for? Uh, that's a great question because I don't think it's all about your degrees and masses of qualifications. I think it's much more around your energy and your intention and, and what can you do with it. Mm -hmm. And do you, you know, do you have a certain amount of the skill set to make that happen? But um, you know, over and over and over again, we see people who. Maybe you, I think I've heard you say hide behind their skill set or hide behind their resume, uh, which can make them think they're better than they are. Oh, the, phrase, the phrase I use is trying to hide behind your finger. You actually can't <laughs> because, yes, you have a big fat degree, but that's just not enough. And especially in the new world where learning and courage and and trust and all of those elements coming in are far, far more important. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I've had the privilege of going to Yale and Harvard, so I could, I could say that that you know, makes me pretty fabulous. But I also realize there's seven and a half billion people on this planet, and it's impossible to think that those schools have captured all the smart people in the world. Mm -hmm. There's a way more smart people, way more motivated people, way more talented people, energetic, creative, good-hearted people in this world than go to any of the specific schools that might spring to mind. Um, so I think what we're really looking for are people who who, who want to succeed, and they've got you know a certain amount of brain power, a certain amount of skill power, uh, but they've got a lot of heart and a lot of courage, um, or fearlessness. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, moving forward, uh, and there are a lot of people. There's a, there's a huge problem of unemployment in this region, for that matter, uh, everywhere in the world, because there's, there's a large youth population here. What sort of advice would you give to these young people getting into the workplace, looking for entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial ideas and so on? What sort of advice would you give to them? How do they reinvent themselves? That's a great question um, because I do think that for young people, entrepreneurship is a fantastic uh, choice mm -hmm. um, because it really does come down to you. And even when times are tough, there's always things that people need. Mm -hmm. We have an expression that we use, which is you have to fish where the fish are. Right. If you want to be successful. 
So I think um, you know, if you can identify a genuine unmet need and then work very hard to meet that need, no matter what it is, mm -hmm. you stand up a really good chance of succeeding. Mm -hmm. The world is getting into automation, into robotics, and so on. So it's exacerbating this this issue of potential future joblessness. Mm -hmm. Firstly, what's your what is your thesis on that? And secondly, what is your advice for people who need to prepare themselves over the next five to ten years with all of these new changes coming in? Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I do yeah. hope that uh, governments and leaders uh, are really wise about how this uh, robotics and automation takes hold. Um, you know, in the United States where I live, there's 50,000 truckers mm -hmm. who could be without a job. Absolutely. And I think as a society, we really need to say, what choice do we want to make here? Mm -hmm. is, this, is this a good choice that we're making? What about learning? Uh, learning different things? Because, you know, when uh, we move from a horse car to uh, a car, when we move from uh, uh, calculators to computers, when we move from uh, hardware to software, we always thought the world will be different and we will have a massive jobless uh, environment. But we always found a way to do, you know, we found a way out of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I dare say we will find a way out from this too. The only difference, in my opinion, as far as the current world is concerned, is the speed of change. That's the only shift. Change has always been there. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, governments are probably too slow, it probably needs the, the the private sector to respond mm -hmm. uh, and it needs the individual to respond uh, far more than governments because they just won't be able to they, they'll be behind the curve every single time um, and and that's yeah, sort of I mean I don't know I mean I would imagine that you'd have or there would be and again I'm not advocating you know huge big government interventions yeah. but I, I to that point I, I can't imagine that you can put a driverless car on the road or a driverless truck on the road mm -hmm. without having some kind of government Fair you know enough. intervention there so yeah. Yeah. Um, or you know, or support or lack thereof. So I would think so. Um, but you know, I mean, um, th look, there's all sorts of jobs that are not going to be automatable. Correct. So, so I think you know, and and people would would characterize those as the creative jobs, the super creative jobs, mm -hmm. the the interpersonal jobs, yep. um, the the physical therapist, the therapist, yep. the, the dog trainer, uh, you know, <laughs> yes. you know, all, I saw that on your list. Um, you know, but I mean, you know, these lists are being made. Mm -hmm. And so I think that as a young person, you know, good grief. I mean, why would you go become a bank teller? Mm -hmm. You know, why, why would you go become a travel, you know, agent? Why would you go, why would you go do something that is clearly going to be automated? Right. Right. So, you know, be smart. I mean, realize that, that, that the kinds of jobs that are going to be there are the ones that have much, much, much more human touch. Mm -hmm. um, but I, um, you know, I would actually say, you know, even HR, you know, HR jobs, which are much more around how do we manage our people? And maybe they'll become how do we integrate our people in our technology? Mm -hmm. um, those are the kinds of jobs that are going to be okay. Kate, you, you seem like a person who's come from a wonderfully gifted environment, your, your parents were wonderful, you went to the best schools in the world, you worked for some of the most amazing companies in the world, now you're traveling the world as a big consultant and author. And every, have you ever encountered failure? <laughs> <laughs> every day. <laughs> to tell every us Every day. You don't seem like it, you're a superwoman, day. I can see the blue cape flying behind Not you. Not true. <laughs> You're my biggest fan. Thank you for that. No, just last week I flamed out. I mean, I did a really terrible job. I, you know, I have a process I have to go through, mm -hmm. sort of a mental preparation before I get up and give a talk. Right. And last week I was somewhere, and for a variety of reasons, I didn't do that, and I did a terrible job. I did a terrible job. Wow, so. how terrible! Did you do a terrible job. <laughs> really like, failure terrible. is a bit more than that. No, really. Did terrible. you ever encounter despair? Did you ever encounter mm -hmm. joblessness? Did you ever, ever encounter no money? And I mean that seriously, because mm -hmm. because a lot of people actually, and I mean, we we spoke about entrepreneurship. A lot of people actually have to start understanding those kinds of difficulties. Empathy. Empathy. Yeah, true empathy. Yeah. Well, yes, indeed. I mean, I have been fired. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I have been fired. Uh, I have been, um, you know, undermined. I mean, I have been, you know, a lot of these terrible things you hear about in sort of corporate environments, you yeah. know. Yeah. I have been in the situation of um, doing, okay, this is going to sound really arrogant, but like doing too good a job. Right. And, you know, for my sins, 
you know, gotten out of the picture. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I've, I've had all those experiences. I've had the experience of saying, you know, hey, let's, um, let's, let's bring a discussion of, you know, women in leadership into this and being told that I was being selfish and uh, <laughs> out for myself. And so, you know, please leave. So I've had all sorts of, I've, yeah, you know, we all, we all experience these things. Um, what advice do you give to and give your two young daughters who are now in their teens? Or... Yeah, they're both nineteen years old. I yeah. have twins, and uh, I actually advise them to. I, I've long been saying that they should be entrepreneurs. Okay. Because um, I mean, they're both pretty self-starting, and they're you know pretty smart. But most of all, I want them to be able to control their own environment, mm -hmm. be because I have experienced these things. Right. I really have experienced these things, and. Uh, you know, I mean, lots of people look glossy from the outside, right. and you don't see all the things that made them um, have the grit that it takes to, to succeed. How do you develop grit in young people? How do you build that resilience yeah. in your 19-year-olds? You know, I think you don't hover over them. I think you, they have to figure out how, how to do things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, some people, I think, just have more internal grit, but I think they also look to you for role model. Mm -hmm. You know, if you curl up like a doodle bug when things get hard, <laughs> yes. um, they'll think that that's okay. Right. And I actually have a, a colleague, a former colleague, who every time things got hard, he went to bed. And I thought, why on earth do you do that? And he said, well, he goes, oh, my mother did that. Interesting. You know? Yeah. And yeah. It actually, it was so funny because once, mm. once I pointed that out, he realized what he was doing. Yeah. You know? So um, I think that we have to be the role models for our kids where, you know, when the going gets tough, you, the tough get going. I mean, I know it's a, it's a cliche, but it's true. Mm -hmm. And um, as my father always used to say, um, it's, it's um, what did he used to say? <laughs> I think he's quoting Chekhov or something. <laughs> but he would say, you know, uh, it, it's a great life if you don't weaken. Yeah. Yeah, my father used to say that if it doesn't... Uh, kill you, it probably makes you stronger. Exactly. And my mom used to sort of, sort of protect me. My father used to say, go. Off you <laughs> was, go, yeah. off you go. And yeah. uh, so, uh, it was wonderful. I, I, and that's one of the reasons that they become very resilient yeah. and very strong. Yeah. But I mean, people do comment on how yeah. my girls are very resilient and they just, they can keep on ticking. Yeah. You Tell us about your, your, the assignments that you're working on in the emerging markets because that's an area that you're specializing in, in terms of reinvention. What sort of experiences are you getting there? Is it a different environment to the West? Are the experiences different to you? Actually, I, I'm kind of amazed at how universal the experience of reinvention is. Mm -hmm. this, the, 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 the concern about um, um, you know, the disturbances that we're having. Um, and they can, they can come at people from everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, we're dealing with a couple of multinationals who are, that are based in the emerging world and they're in the food business, and they're in the hotel business, you know, hospitality business, yeah. and they're in the um, apparel business. And let me tell you something, those are global businesses that are being, you know, disturbed, that are being reinvented, mm -hmm. that are being disrupted. And, um, you know, they're just as worried as anybody else is about, you know, who's gonna come up with some new form? Is it gonna be, is it gonna be a different taste? Is it gonna be a different delivery? Mm -hmm. Is it gonna be, a different way of cooking things? Is it gonna be somehow meeting the needs of this demographic? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're just about as worried about it as anybody else. Yeah. Are you living a perfect life in your own eyes at the moment? Indeed not. Why not? <laughs> because why, you, you have, the world's your oyster, you could do exactly what you want to do, why aren't you? Well, because I can't do exactly what I want to do because like everybody else, I'm trying to build a business, Okay. right? And, and when you're trying to build a business, you have to work very hard, you have to make sacrifices, you have to, um, uh, I, I'm getting the feeling you think my life is very glamorous, but actually, <laughs> but actually I'm going to be, uh, I've been on the road for two weeks and I'm staying in my eighth different place. Okay. Um, and it's so it's tiring, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's exhilarating, but it's also demanding. So let me uh, give another perspective. I'm in exactly the same position. I'm an entrepreneur, I'm yeah. struggling. I, I have cash uh, ch choking here and there. I have all sorts of issues like that. But am I living my almost dream life? The yeah, answer is yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because I jump out of bed every morning. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, fatigue is there, but you know, so what? Yeah. Um, 
So are you living your dream in that way? So that at least you're going in the direction that you want to go? Yeah, with? absolutely. Because I really can't imagine doing anything else. Yeah, this is what I mean. And, and, and I yeah. think when you get to that point, yeah. you've actually arrived. When you, when you wake up in the morning and it's, you don't go to work, you just do what you're born to do. You, you, you reach out and, that is true. And, and engage with that. So, you know, issues like fatigue and changing hotels and so on, it's, it's, part, it's boring and it's tedious, but the fundamentals are so much stronger. People ask me this question all the time, why the hell are you doing what you're doing? Mm -hmm. You could quite easily be you know, in a fancy you know, job. I've attempted to have jobs. Okay. <laughs> and it, it really isn't, it doesn't work very well for me. Right. Because mm -hmm. I need to be creating my own space. Right. That's just, it's, it's what I do. And I have a fantastic partner. I yeah. mean, Shane is a fantastic partner. And we're very yin and yang. Mm -hmm. We have really different styles and different strengths and weaknesses, but yep. we have an extremely common mission. Yeah. We have we have we want to have the same outcome, and so, we bring different things to the table. So, do you think that is one of the elements, the secret sauce, uh, in terms of a successful Absolutely. environment, is to have a wing person? He's not my wing person. We are equal. Okay. Yeah, and no, that's mm -hmm. true. I mean, he is a very very strong person, mm -hmm. and uh, he's a very driving person. So, I mean, for me, um, yeah, I, it's a yin-yang thing. I, there's no, there isn't a dominant character. Okay. Uh, to be honest, he's the dominant character. <laughs> he's, no, he's, he's very, he's very driving. And, right. and to me, that's great. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Looking forward 10 years from now, what are the sort of things that you would have achieved in terms of your business and in terms of your, your life? Yeah. Oh, we will have had a huge impact on how people, um, think and do leadership. I think, I, I genuinely hope and believe that we're going to democratize leadership with inside a company. Mm -hmm. That uh, we really will help lower power distance mm -hmm. inside of companies and we will help more people have voice. Because I think that that's actually how you're gonna have much better companies, not just in terms of what their results are, you know, financial results, mm -hmm. but you'll bring in more sensibilities. Yeah. Um, and when you bring in more sensibilities, hopefully we'll have companies that'll be more creative around you know, how they conduct themselves in the world. New leadership versus new models of technology and, and working. Are they all coming together? And what are the two or three things we need to look well, for to align? Yeah, that's the dream. I mean, the dream is that uh, because we live, we live in world, well, if you, if you just had a traditional sort of, you know, the old military style, yeah. you know, the boss tells what to do and the decisions cascade down and yeah. that's just how it happens. Mm -hmm. it, it, that is, it, that's an impossible model in a complicated world. Right. It's an impossible model mm -hmm. because that person can't know enough. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so you have to have, you really have to think of it more as terms of a network than a, than a you know, a pyramid. Mm -hmm. And all those nodes need to be taking in information and sharing information. And everyone's experimenting right. with how do you actually do that? How do you actually maximize that? Mm -hmm. And how do, you, how do you get the decisions to the right places? So if there was a time capsule around us and we would project ourselves into the future and today is your 90th birthday and, oh we, come, and we come to celebrate your 90th birthday, uh, what, what will we be saying about Kate? What has she achieved in the next 40, 50 years? She tried hard. <laughs> well, a bit more than that. Will you be a grumpy granny? No, I'm going to be a fabulous <laughs> granny. You're a gorgeous actually. granny. So a bit no, wonder. I'm going to be a great granny. I mean, actually, you know, because uh, I actually, that, well, you, okay, you asked me in the future. I actually would like to be in a place that when I do have grandchildren that I'm really not working so hard. Okay. Because I would like to be very, very involved in that. And I think, and I would love to be able to support, you know, should my girls do that, I would love to be able to support them so they can go out and do their things. Mm -hmm. So, it's, uh, so apart from uh, being a grandmother, any other achievements that we will be celebrating? Well, you know, I do need to write my great American novel. Okay. Yeah. So one of the things that I'm really happy about with my life, there's many things I'm happy about with my life. But one of the things I'm happy about is I feel like I really have, you know, lived a pretty vivid life. Right. I mean, I've had a lot of really high quality experiences. Right. And I've, I'm in my 40th country at mm -hmm. this point and I'm not stopping. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I'm going to take up free diving. <laughs> okay, obviously. <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, I, I, I've just had a tremendous number of experiences, and I've met a tremendous number of people, and uh, yeah, I've had successes and failures, and uh, and and uh, I don't know. I I think I've tried to make the most of being on this planet. Excellent. 
Kate, uh, love your story, love your energy, love the way you engage with the whole world and you're traveling and you, you know, you're a wonder woman as I started this whole question, this whole thing. So nice. <laughs> so nice. And, and, and humble with it, which is even, even no, better. That makes, you, uh, that makes you even more no perfect. No blindfolds on that one, I'll tell you. <laughs> Yeah. But it's really been delightful to have you here, delightful to come to our little office. And Always a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Kate Sweetman is an author, editor, a leadership consultant, and a celebrated speaker. She is the founding principal and chief talent officer at her company. Kate worked as an editor at the Harvard Business Review and currently working at MIT's Legatum Center for Development and Entrepreneurship. She was also an advisor at Yale University for Women's Leadership Initiative. Kate has been named the Emerging Guru from the Times of London and was listed as Thinkers 50 for her body of work during her career. She co-authored Leadership Code and Reinvention. She also has a BA from Yale University and an MBA from Harvard Business School. We are here today with the wonderful Kate Sweetman. She's talking to us about invention and reinvention. And this is actually the title of her book, Reinvention. And it's to be delighted and privileged to have you, Kate. Welcome. It is I who am del <laughs> delighted and privileged. What are your views on failure, Kate? I read a book when I was 13 years old. And what it really said in essence was the difference between people who succeed and people who fail is whether or not they give up. And that's the truth. That's the truth. That people who fail, or people who succeed, fail just as much as people who ultimately don't succeed. The difference is they keep going. You mentioned uh, Alibaba and Jack Ma and various others. And you use the phrase, it's darkest before the dawn. Right. Can you say a bit more about that? There's a, there's a common phrase, it's always darkest before the dawn. And you do have to keep in mind that if you're trying to do something big or important or unknown or a reinvention, you're going to a new place, it's going to feel like you're going to fail because by definition, you don't know what you're doing. So it's going to be very dark before that dawn. But there will be a turn there will be a light, something is gonna happen, but you have to stick with it. Jobs versus entrepreneurship. Well, I'm a huge fan of entrepreneurship. Um, it, it, it really depends on, on the kind of person you are. Um, but if you wanna create your own environment, if you, want, if you have a strong vision, um, if, you, if you have a hard time fitting into somebody else's idea of you know, who you should be and what you should be doing, then I think entrepreneurship is a great way to go. What do you say to young people who are trying to find their first job? Uh, just get started. Just get started. I, I, you know, I, I know an awful lot of people who are in their 40s, even their 50s, who say, oh, I never found out what I wanted to do. And I, I have to ask them, you know, how hard did you try? So uh, you know, switching jobs is not failure. It, that's just seeking and searching. And as long as your intention is to find out what you like and what you don't like, that's fine. What advice do you give to your 16-year-old self? If I could go back to my 16-year-old self, I would say, take yourself seriously. You know, believe that you can do really great things. Because you flatter me a lot that I'm this superwoman, but actually um, I think that there have definitely been times when I've lacked the courage of my convictions, and I wish I had actually gone after things in a bigger way. If we were to do a movie about you, who would play Kate? I could pick anyone. Okay, I want to say Kate Winslet because my husband thinks she's the most beautiful woman in the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's competition for you. Then. That's okay. That's okay. I think she's pretty great. Yeah. So, what will your autobiography be called? Uh, she she gave it a good shot. <laughs> Is that your legacy and thing? And it'll be on your tombstone. Yeah. Yeah. She gave it a good shot. Yeah, she Please. gave it a good shot. She gave it a good shot. Yeah. What final advice would you give to a young person going out there in this, in this big bad world we have today? Uh, well, speaking as somebody who has reinvented herself many times, who's been um, 
a bad marketer, <laughs> who's been an MBA student, who's been a consultant, who's been an author, who's been a, an editor, who's been many, many things, and who at each turn had to take on new skills and do new things and work with new people. Uh, recognize and rejoice in the idea that you will be reinventing yourself constantly and uh, be alert to that. And take in all the information that you need so that you know what to do when the time comes. Kate, uh, love your story, love your energy, love the way you engage with the whole world and you're traveling and you, you know, you're a wonder woman as I started this whole question, this whole thing. So nice. <laughs> so nice. And, and, and humble with it, which is uh, even, even no, better. That makes, you, uh, that makes you even more no perfect. No blindfolds on that one, I'll tell you. <laughs> Yeah. But it's really been delightful to have you here, delightful to come to our little office. And Always a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed, real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I read a book when I was 13 years old. And what it really said in essence was, the difference between people who succeed and people who fail is whether or not they give up. And that's the truth. That's the truth. That people who fail, or people who succeed, fail just as much as people who ultimately don't succeed. The difference is they keep going. You mentioned uh, Alibaba and Jack Ma and various others, and you use the phrase, it's darkest before the dawn. Right. Can you say a bit more about that? There's a, there's a common phrase, it's always darkest before the dawn. And you do have to keep in mind that if you're trying to do something big or important or unknown or a reinvention, you're going to a new place, it's going to feel like you're going to fail because by definition, you don't know what you're doing. So it's going to be very dark before that dawn. But there will be a turn. There will be a light. Something is going to happen, but you have to stick with it. Jobs versus entrepreneurship. Well, I'm a huge fan of entrepreneurship. Um, it, it, it really depends on, on the kind of person you are. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to create your own environment, if you, want, if you have a strong vision, um, if, you, if you have a hard time fitting into somebody else's idea of you know, who you should be and what you should be doing, then I think entrepreneurship is a great way to go. What do you say to young people who are trying to find their first job? Uh, just get started. Just get started. I, I you know, uh, I know an awful lot of people who are in their 40s, even their 50s, who say, "Oh, I never found out what I wanted to do," and I, I have to ask them, you know, how hard did you try? So, uh, you know, switching jobs is not failure. It, that's just seeking and searching. And as long as your intention is to find out what you like and what you don't like, that's fine. What advice do you give to your 16-year-old self? If I could go back to my 16-year-old self, I would say, take yourself seriously. You know, believe that you can do really great things. Because you flatter me a lot that I'm this superwoman, but actually um, I think that there have definitely been times when I've lacked the courage of my convictions, and I wish I had actually gone after things in a bigger way. If we were to do a movie about you, who would play Kate? I could pick anyone. Okay, I want to say Kate Winslet because my husband thinks she's the most beautiful woman in the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's competition for you. Then. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I think she's pretty great. Yeah. So what will your autobiography be called? Uh, she, she gave it a good shot. <laughs> Is that your legacy and, thing, and it'll be on your tombstone? Yeah, yeah. She gave it a good shot. Yeah, she Please gave it a good shot. She gave it a good shot. Yeah. What final advice would you give to a young person going out there in this, in this big bad world we have today? Uh, well, speaking as somebody who has reinvented herself many times, who's been um, a bad marketer, <laughs> who's been an MBA student, who's been a consultant, who's been an author, who's been a, an editor, who's been many, many things, and who at each turn had to take on new skills and do new things and work with new people. 
uh, recognize and rejoice in the idea that you will be reinventing yourself constantly and uh, be alert to that and take in all the information that you need so that you know what to do when the time comes.